My friend Mick Veach, you may remember Mick, he was here a couple years ago for the Missional Holiness Conference. Uh, Mick Veach recently wrote the following. He said, watching the news is overwhelming. The new normals are frightening and discouraging. Terrorism, violence, injustice, and crazy politics can make the most optimistic change their song. Good news today. Regardless of how desperate the current situation is, it will be the church's finest hour. It will be during these unprecedented times that the church will rise up. She may not look like she does currently, but nonetheless, victory will shine even as pain, suffering, and persecution are present. Remember that the cross delivered all that we need, so let's hold on to this anchor as we march into what the Bible calls the final days. Our greatest days are not behind. And that's the end of the quote. As we think of our nation and many of the, the national monuments and memorials and even the official buildings in our nation's capital, many of them are engraved with scriptures indicating the undeniable influence of God and his people on the early history of our nation. In recent decades, our nation has taken actions that deny his existence, defy his law, and destroy his influence in our land. But efforts of denial, defiance, and destruction cannot limit the power of our almighty God. He and his people remain victorious, and his presence is with us. And as we have been studying the book of Hebrews, the Hebrew writer writing to Jewish people who had come to know Christ as Savior were drawing the connections between what was the practice of Old Testament Judaism that they had been trained in from their childhood and faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah and how they connected. That's what the book of Hebrews is all about and showing that Jesus is the fulfillment of all those symbols and signs and prophecies that were involved in the Old Testament worship. But as we think about God's presence being with us, the the tabernacle with the Ark of the Covenant signified the presence of God with the Israelites. The tabernacle was at the center of the camp with the Levitical priests nearest around the Ark of the Covenant and, and the tabernacle. And then on each side, all four sides, there were three tribes of Israel in the camp. This was in the wilderness experience as God had led the children of Israel out of Egypt across the Red Sea under the leadership of Moses, and they, they would set up camp. And, and the Ark of the Covenant was where the presence of God dwelt for the people. And it was a symbol This tabernacle with the Ark of the Covenant was a symbol of the presence of God among the people. And this morning we're going to look a little bit further at what that means to us. Now I know that uh, much of this is unfamiliar to us. If you're new to the church and new to the Bible and new to Christianity, uh, this may seem pretty deep and pretty difficult to understand. Uh, However, the people that the Hebrew writer was talking to, this was very common to them. This, this was the, the religion that they had practiced, and they were able to, to understand very simply. And I will try to, try to help explain to you as best I can in the few minutes that I have this morning as we go along. But I also want to point out to you, not very far from here, over in Lancaster County. Anybody ever been to Lancaster County? Yeah, I thought almost everybody. It's not that far. And uh, they have a place, the Lancaster Mennonite Information Center. Uh, Just right along Route 30, there's a sign, and and they have an information center that's just off of uh, Route 30 there in Lancaster. And they have a model of the tabernacle. I was there maybe six, eight weeks ago uh, and, and went through it as I knew I was preparing to preach this series uh, from Hebrews, I thought it would be good to, to kind of see that and be reminded of it. And it's a very worthwhile time, and it only takes you maybe an hour or two to, to be there and to, 
to see it. There's a picture that I took while I was there. Did we already go past the picture? If we can go back to it. Maybe we can't. There it is. It's not very clear on the screen. I'm sorry about that. But that was a tapestry that was hanging there in that uh, Tabernacle Information Center. And if you notice, the white blur in the middle there is the fence around the tabernacle. And then inside there is the holy place where the people would worship. And then at the far end where the white streak is coming down is where the presence of God was represented and all around then is the people, three tribes on each side around the nation. My apologies for the lack of quality of that. That was a picture of a tapestry taken by a, a cell phone and then enlarged for the big screen. And so it loses a lot in the translation there. But I hope it gives you at least a little bit of an idea of what to do. But the point is that through Jesus, it gets better. Through Jesus, it gets better. Not only did, did God dwell in the tabernacle, not only did he dwell in particular in the Ark of the Covenant, but God dwells in us through Jesus Christ. And so this morning, as we continue our sermon series, Revealed, A Glimpse of God, we want to look at the, the message, It Gets Better, referring to Jesus as it gets better for us in this New Testament era than what they had in the Old Testament era. The first thing that we want to notice is the message about Christ's nature. In that Ark of the Covenant, all the way back to the time of Moses, the, the tabernacle and the, and the Ark of the Covenant was a foreshadowing of the coming of Jesus Christ. And the Ark of the Covenant was constructed of both wood and overlaid with pure gold. And it symbolized the humanity and the deity of Jesus Christ. The wood symbolized, symbolized Jesus' humanity. Jesus was, look, was like us, except he was sinless. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. And, and the wood that was in that uh, ark represented the humanity of Jesus, and we must not minimize that. In Hebrews 7, 26, it says, Such a high priest meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. We see his humanity and his deity. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, it says, <clears throat> excuse me, For you know that it was not the, with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. In order for God to redeem us, there needed to be the shedding of blood, and in order for there to be shedding of blood, Jesus had to come and take on a physical body. <clears throat> but not only was he human, but he was God. And the pure gold over, that overlaid the Ark of the Covenant symbolized Jesus' deity. Jesus was God in the flesh. In John 1, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then down in verse 14 of John 1, it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so that pure gold symbolized the, the deity of Jesus Christ. And we must never minimize either Jesus' true humanity or his true deity. In order for him to redeem us, he both had to die and shed his blood and also had to be greater than we were. He had to be without sin and without blame, which only can be done by God. That cannot be done by humanity. So he was both God and man. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2, it says, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he 
made the universe. And then down in verse 8 of Hebrews 1, it says, but about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. Jesus Christ, the God-man, came and died for us. And we ought to appreciate Jesus' true humanity and realize that he understands our temptations, our trials, our sorrows, and our needs. You see, some, some people worship a God that's way out there, an, an almighty God that creates all things, but he doesn't understand his creation. He's just out there. He's far from us. But in Jesus Christ, that same God with all of his power came and dwelt among us. And in Jesus Christ, he bore our sins. He he understands hunger and thirst and pain and suffering and loss. At the graveside of his friend Lazarus, Jesus wept. He understands all of these human experiences because he's been here and done that. And that's what makes Jesus so, so very special to us. The second thing that we notice is the message about God's presence in Christ. He came and dwelt among us. The ark symbolized God's presence. And I already point out how how the tabernacle with the Ark of the Covenant was right at the center of the camp. And all around that tabernacle was where the people dwelt. God met his people at the Ark. And Jesus is the focal point of God's presence. He is with us. He came and he dwelt upon this earth. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, it says, the virgin was with child and will give birth to a child, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Our God who is above all, who, who, who created all things, that, that is incomparable and unapproachable, became man and dwelt among us, and his presence is here. And the tabernacle indicated God's desire to dwell with his people. Not only did he deliver them from Egyptian slavery and bring them safely through the Red Sea and into the wilderness, but he came and dwelt with them. He tabernacled with them. But due to their sin, God was separated from them. If you notice, there was fence, a fence around and, and then within the tent. And uh, when, you, when you would come into the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was, there was only one human being that was allowed to go there. And he was only allowed to go in there one time a year. And that was the high priest. And he would go in to offer a sacrifice for us. Anyone else that went in, or even if the high priest went into the presence of God at any other time, or went in carelessly, would be stricken dead immediately. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, it says, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came to be God's presence with us, to reconcile ourselves to God, and then those of us who have been reconciled to God, we become God's ambassadors to take this wonderful message of of God's presence among us and his salvation out into the world. Uh, But not only was the Ark of the Covenant within this most holy place, but it was also portable. There were four rings that were located on the ark so that the Levites could put staves through them and transport the ark when the tabernacle was moved from location to location. Uh, God would lead them and move them uh, to various places in the wilderness, and the the Levites were able to to carry that ark. In other words, it, it symbolizes wherever the people went, God's presence was with them. They never left God's presence. In Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, the Great Commission, it says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them, 
to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You see, not only was God's presence with them in the tabernacle, but in Jesus Christ, he brought the presence of God among us. God's presence is with us wherever we go. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, it says, But keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Going back to the words of Mick Veach in the introduction, we, we don't know what's ahead. Our nation has been on a downward spiral, and we don't know what's going to happen. And there are people in other parts of the world who for decades and even centuries have been persecuted for the cause of Jesus Christ. And perhaps we may face persecution at some point, but the blessed truth of Jesus Christ is that he will never leave us nor forsake us. He is in us, and he will be with us. And as, as the symbolism of the Old Testament that the ark was portable, and wherever God led the people that the presence of God was with them, it's even greater. It gets even better because Jesus is in us and has promised to never leave us nor forsake us. And the message of Christ's sacrifice, all of these messages are seen in the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant uh, in the Old Testament. The the message about Christ's sacrifice, blood was sprinkled on the Ark. I mentioned about how the high priest was able to go into the holiest of holies only once a year. And when the Ark stood in the holy of holies, Once a year, on the Day of Atonement, Israel's high priest carried the blood of sacrificial animals through the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place. The holy place is where the people worshipped. The the Holy of Holies was where the presence of God dwelt with the Ark of the Covenant. In Leviticus chapter 16, verses 14 and 15, it says, He is to take some of the bull's blood, that's the high priest, is to take some of the bull's blood and with his finger sprinkle it on the front of the atonement cover. Then he shall sprinkle some of it with his finger seven times before the atonement cover. He shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people, and then take its blood behind the curtain and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of it. And so he would first sprinkle blood on on the seed or the covering of the ark to atone for his own sins as a human high priest, and then he sprinkled blood on the lid, the mercy seat, to atone for the sins of the people, the shedding of the blood. And this had to be done annually for the sacrifice of blood for the sins of the people. But Jesus shed his blood once and for all. He died once in order to redeem and to save us from our sins. In Hebrews 7.27, the Hebrew writer explaining this to the, the Jewish believers, he said, unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. The victory that we need in our lives for the forgiveness of sin and to live lives that are pleasing to God took place one time with the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. In in Hebrews 9, verses 10 and 11, it says, When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The Hebrew writer tells us at other places that actually the tabernacle on earth uh, was but a symbol of the reality of heaven. And Jesus suffered and sacrificed his life and entered into the reality of the heavenly temple. And just as the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat 
it came between the commandments inside the ark and the gaze of a holy God. So the blood of Jesus, blood, came between the commandments we had broken and God. When God sees us, we are covered by the blood of Christ if we have received him as our Savior. And so our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, it says he is the anointing sacrifice, or excuse me, the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus died on the cross for the sins of everyone. And as his people, we should be sharing the gospel with everyone. We should be desiring that everyone would come to know Jesus as their personal Savior. And then one last quick symbolism that we find there at the ark is that the angels, there were two angels that were face down looking down onto the mercy seat. And we see the symbolism here that angels are not recipients of redemption, but sinners are. Peter explained it this way in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. This great salvation that has been made through the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ is something that is so great that even the angels of heaven look into, long for, to understand the salvation that is available to us. It is a great salvation. Jesus didn't die for the angels. He died for sinners, of which we are as part of the human race. And the Ark of the Covenant was off limits to the people of Israel, but Jesus invites everyone to come to him. No matter what has happened in your life, no matter who you are, no matter what sins you have committed, the blood of Jesus Christ avails for your sin and is available to you. And if you haven't come to him for salvation, why not come today in faith? Jesus promised that he will never drive away whoever comes to him. And so if you're here today and you do not know Jesus, if you've never experienced this great salvation, I invite you to come to Christ this morning. Perhaps you already prayed during communion to receive Christ as Savior, but I would like in my closing prayer to include a prayer of, of confession and, and repentance. And if there's anyone here who has never received Christ as Savior, I invite you to pray that prayer with me. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the cross of Jesus Christ. We thank you that Jesus left heaven and came to earth as God in flesh and that he laid down his life for us. And as we're here this morning, centuries and even millennia later, the blood of Christ still atones for our sin and the presence of Christ is still available in our lives. And Lord, if there's any among us who have never come to know Christ as Savior, I pray that they would join me in their hearts in this prayer and ask Jesus to forgive their sin and to be their Savior. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I was born in sin. I confess my sin to you. Not only have I been born into sin, but I have committed acts of sin. And so, Lord, I come to you today in confession and repentance. I repent of my sin. I turn from my sin. I change my mind. I change my direction. Instead of pursuing the sin of this world, I turn to you and ask you to forgive my sin and to be my Savior. And Lord, this day I turn my life in a new, new direction and I have decided to follow you the remaining days of my life. Lord, I pray that you would answer the prayers of any who have prayed that prayer in their heart this morning and that their lives would be changed and that they would know the presence of Jesus Christ 
in their lives. And oh, what a difference it can make, not only in their personal lives, but in their families and in their neighborhoods and in their workplaces and wherever they go, and even for generations to come, can be impacted by this one decision this morning to ask Jesus to be their Savior. I pray this morning that there would be those who would turn to you in repentance and receive Jesus as their Savior. Lord, send us all forth to be your people. It's good to gather. It's good to be together with God's people. But Lord, send us out from this building to be your church in the world where our witness is so desperately needed. Lord, may you be glorified as your people go forth to serve you this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.